Okay. I'm here today uh, for a press conference which is being presented by a combination of the National Space Society and the Space Frontier Foundation. Our two organizations are working together uh, to present this press conference because of the importance of the topic at hand. And this concerns uh, what I've got up here, which is a short version of the title of the study, Evolvable Lunar Architecture Study. I'm Mark Hopkins. I'm the moderator uh, for this event. And I'm also the CEO of the National Space Society. This here gives the plan uh, for today. At the top, we have the actual full title uh, for the uh, report. It's the Economic Assessment and Systems Analysis of an Evolvable Lunar Architecture that leverages commercial space capabilities and public-private partnerships. You can see why I had a short version on the first slide. Uh, and here's the uh, people that will be speaking. I, in a minute, will say something about the National Space Society. And then the next speaker will be Gary Olson, and he's on the board of the Space Frontier Foundation. And he'll say something about that organization. And then we'll have the person who did the, most of the work, the principal investigator, Charles Miller. He'll come up and uh, uh, talk about the meat of the subject. And he's also president of Next Gen uh, Space LLC, which is a company which uh, did the project. And then we will have four additional people uh, who will make comments, and they're quite an illustrious group, uh, concerning the study, uh, either by video in two cases or they're, they're here in person. After that, we'll have questions. So let's talk about National Space Society. We are the premier activist grassroots organization which is in supporting the Human Space Flight Center human space flight in the world. We were founded by Warner Von Braun in 1974. We have offices in Washington, D.C., although we're an international organization. We have a number of illustrious individuals which have been involved with our organization, one of which is Buzz Aldrin, uh, who is former chair of our board of directors. Of course, he is the uh, second man who went to the moon. We also have as one of our alumni executive directors, George Whitesides, who left us in 2009 to become the chief of staff at NASA. And currently, he is the CEO of Virgin Galactic. And of course, Lori Garver, who was a former executive director of the National Space Society. Uh, she was, up until recently, the uh, deputy <coughs> director of NASA, which is a number two position. Currently, she is the general manager at the Airline Pilots Association, which is the big international pilots union, has over 50,000 pilots in it. And with that, I wanted to just make one comment personally about the study. And here's my view. The most important thing is we can reduce the cost of returning to the moon by a factor of 10. That's an order of magnitude. And this really changes everything. And I say that in part because of my background. I'm an economist by training. I have degrees in economics from the California Institute of Technology and also Harvard University. And so when I look at programs, I'm always sort of running mentally in my mind, cost-benefit analysis. And if you drop the cost by a factor of 10, from a policy viewpoint, all of a sudden, you've increased the importance, you've increased the benefits uh, of doing this project uh, by a factor of 10, and that's really big. With that, I'm going to introduce Gary Olson. Uh, he is the next speaker. He's a senior aerospace engineer at TASC, is a board member of the Space Frontier Foundation, which is why he'll be up here in a sec, and also a former board member of, our, of my organization, the National Space Society. Gary? Thank you, Mark. So. You had it on. Oh, I, I did it. <laughs> So um, I represent the S Space Frontier Foundation, an organization of people dedicated to opening the space frontier to human settlement as rapidly as possible. I want to also thank the Heinland Prize Trust, who, is, uh, who helped sponsor this event. This study, shows, this, this study shows the possibility of dramatic cost reductions for deep space missions. Beyond that, it demonstrates that public-private partnerships can lead to economic growth 
that is increasingly self-supporting. It challenges any notion we may have that space commerce was, must lag far behind uh, exploration as we move out into the solar system. It rather, commerce is an equal partner to exploration. Commerce must ultimately take the lead for us to incorporate the solar system in our economic sphere, as John Markberger once put it. Commerce, empowered by free enterprise, is key to leading human civilization into space. Only commerce can drive a thriving space economy that will enable and require human settlement. Now and forever, the most valuable thing in space is people. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charles Miller. He is the principal investigator of the project. And as I said earlier, this will be the meat of uh, what we're talking about. He's also president of NextGen uh, Space LLC. He's executive coordinator of the Alliance for Space Development, which is an alliance between the National Space Science, uh, Foundation and the Space Frontier Foundation for legislative purposes, and also has 10 other organizations involved in it as well. He's co-founder of NanoRax, which is a corporation which is currently putting uh, uh, experiments on the space station. He's formerly NASA's senior advisor for commercial space. He's also a board member, former board member of the National Space Society. Charles? Thanks, Mark. First, I want to thank uh, the Space Frontier Foundation and the National Space Society for sponsoring this press event of the, um, this study that was funded by NASA. So I also want to thank uh, NASA uh, for their uh, financial support for doing all the work we did. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, we uh, put in a proposal last summer, uh, which was uh, in a competitive proposal. There was five winners in the Office of Chiefs Technologist, and we were funded at 100000 So this is a initial study about the feasibility of uh, returning to the moon. I, um, let's see here. So, is this, okay. So, top level view. So we basically say um, the results of this study um, that uh, with a step-by-step -step incremental fashion, leveraging commercial partnerships that you can return to them and it's technically, it's, uh, technically feasible. So, uh, and the context of this is NASA's made three major attempts to get approval to go back to the moon and onto the Mars in the last 45 years since Apollo. And every one of them has basically uh, been turned down by uh, our elected leaders, both Congress and, and the White House. Um, and it's, they failed because uh, the minimum cost was $100 billion and the price grew from there to, to many hundreds of billions to, in, in one case, almost a trillion dollars. And it was just uh, a non-starter. So the base of this study was leveraging the now lessons learned from COTS and commercial crew, could you go back to the moon? Is it technically feasible and what would it cost? That's the core questions of this study. And, and um, so that's what we are looking at. We put together a team, NextGen put together a team of uh, fo all former NASA, very uh, experienced former NASA people who work in these areas. Um, I was the principal investigator, NASA senior advisor for commercial space. In the back of the room is Dr. Alan Wilhite. He's the co-principal investigator. He led the technical analysis. He uh, set up the systems analysis branch at Langley that now leads NASA's studies of these types of uh, systems um, of, of uh, deep space human space flight. And he was uh, head of uh, program assessment for Dan Golden. And then he, for the last 15 years, he's been training uh, grad students and PhD students in how you do this type of analysis. Who he, so he led this. Um, I also want to mention uh, uh, the support of uh, Edgar Zapata from Kennedy, who is a life cycle cost expert. He's at, at Kennedy, so we received generous support um, on uh, really hard data on uh, how the life cycle costs. And I want to mention David Chevron here, um, he, who was uh, 37 years in safety and mission assurance, including 19 years at NASA JSC. So he's an expert on human spaceflight uh, safety and mission assurance. So we used all that. and. Uh, Several other people that you you have in your press packets or on your on the thumb drives, the media had all this information there. We also took the extra step. We set up an independent review team, 
of, the, of these people, all uh, a bunch of s former senior NASA people, uh, human spaceflight people, four former astronauts, uh, uh, space policy professionals. We did a day-long independent review in March. We were asking them, is, uh, is, are we missing anything? What are we missing? Uh, any showstoppers? Tell us, uh, um, you know, you know what's wrong with with uh, our approach. And we got uh, some great feedback. We incorporated it, and and many of the uh, uh, stuff in the final report. There's a hundred page final report. It's uh, gone online. You'll get the URL at the end, but it's available. So this team, the the core team I showed in the previous slide, and this independent review team, you know, the the expertise that they have all shows up in this. And two members of the independent review team are sitting at the table at the far end, Hoyt Davidson. He led the economic uh, sub-team uh, looking at the economic analysis. And Tom Moser, um, uh, he uh, was critical on the technical review team. And uh, we'll, they'll uh, be providing the views of the independent review team. And we'll also have a video from Chris Kraft, the founder of NASA Mission Con Control and NASA JSC director, center director for 10 years, who will, we have a video of him providing his views. He, his health did not permit him to be here. Um, what is an evolvable lunar architecture? So this is what we study. We broke it up in three phases. We made it t as technically easy in phase one, no new technology to the maximum extent possible in phase one to human sorties to the moon. Then with, uh, do it with your lunar lander that you can put down at the poles, you use propellant, you develop and prove propellant transfer in parallel. When that's ready, you go into phase two, you put the same lunar lander at the poles, humans at the poles. And in parallel with this, you're doing uh, uh, robotics uh, prospectors to the poles to find out where the, the best water is, how much it is, how deep it is, because you want to pick the best polar crater. It's location, location, location. Real estate ma and value matters. And then in parallel with that, you're developing the technology you need for in situ resource utilization. That means using the resources of the moon. When that's ready and the technology's ready to use it, you're, you're enabled to go into phase three, which allows a reusable lunar lander, which dramatically changes the economics. And, uh, and our research shows that you can uh, have a permanent lunar base all within a very constrained fixed budget. We leveraged at, to the maximum extent possible existing systems, um, Earth orbit rendezvous and propellant transfer. And uh, so it's a step-by-step -step steady progress of using existing commercial systems. Um, the summary of the study conclusions. It's technically feasible. Um, uh, the conclusion of the study is technically feasible to leverage commercial systems to return to the moon five to seven years from authority to proceed. And the total cost of, the, of that uh, we estimate for two providers is $10 billion. All our cost data is anchored on the commercial crew and, and, and commercial ISS cargo, so we can't cost estimate a single provider because both of those were under the situation of competition. So, uh, we, we, so we, are, we actually have much more fidelity assuming competition. It'd be about $10 billion, about $5 billion each, plus or minus 30%, so there's some uncertainty in here. We believe that the next president who comes in, if they started this, could uh, have, uh, by the end of their second term, have humans return to the moon. Um, and the cost of duplicating Apollo is about $12 billion. You've the, the first footsteps and basically six missions. Apollo today is about $140 billion in current dollars, so that's about an order of magnitude reduction. Uh, this, could, uh, this enables a permanent lunar base by phase three. So uh, we uh, looked at two human missions a year with six months terms, four astronauts offset, four cargo delivery missions, one every three months. You can do this all within a fixed $2.8 billion budget. Uh, takes you about 10 years, 12 years from the first footsteps about that to get to step by step to a permanent lunar base that's producing 200 metric tons of propellant. It's got a very economic focus. 200 metric tons of propellant in lunar orbit to enable NASA to have affordable missions to Mars. That is a key strategic goal. So uh, total estimated cost of that is about $40 billion. This all assumes a new partnership in the later phases for an international lunar authority or something like that. And our analysis suggests this is a, a very effective way 
to make the partnerships even better. And there's a lot of detail in the, in the uh, full report on this. Um, implications for NASA going to Mars. A commercial lunar base would make uh, much more affordable to go to Mars. Uh, propellant is 80% of the mass that uh, under all 100% Earth-based approaches. If you can get your propellant already there for you at low cost, it radically lowers the cost of Mars and the technical complexity. So, uh, for example, our current uh, approach for sending humans to Mars, uh, that NASA's baseline, it needs 10 to 12 launches of SLS. It's very risky and operationally complex to have that many missions. So you only need three. It actually makes an SLS-based Mars approach much more technically affordable, uh, technically feasible and affordable. So we think this actually works very well with the baseline SLS uh, launch vehicle that NASA is developing. Um, and, and we think it could substantially pay, since it's a commercial lunar base, all owned and operated by infrastructure, that uh, could stand, uh, NASA as a customer propellant would uh, basically could substantially pay and potentially even 100% pay for the operation of the lunar base. Um, it has implications for private and other government space travel. In phase three, our analysis suggests that the cost of a trip to the moon to stay there for a week or two and come home on the surface of the moon is 150 to 200 million dollars. Right now, Space Adventures has sold a couple seats to go a trip around the moon, just to, to look at the far side of the moon and come home for $150 million a seat. For that same price, so they're proving there's a market, that same price, you can visit the moon and stay there a week and then come home. And we also believe there's lots of other countries that uh, the first uh, citizen of Japan, Germany, France, Canada, there's going to be serious demand for uh, U.S. commercial providers to take those citizens to the moon and do some real work. Um, public benefits. There are significant public benefits on this, but now, as I think Mark made a very good point, the cost-benefit ratio goes up by an order of magnitude. Uh, I think the most significant is economic growth and national security. Economic growth, you're going to be driving. We already see proof of this, that these partnerships have significant economic growth. Um, with the COTS ISS cargo delivery system, uh, U.S. has recaptured uh, a, a tie for world leadership in space launch. Um, we had lost leadership in that, because, but now SpaceX last year had as many launches as, our, as Europe. Um, and it's significant benefits to national security the same. So if we do this, you're going to have much higher flight rates and lower reduction of costs of American uh, launch and in-space infrastructure, and that has significant economic growth and national security benefits. Much more detail about this in the report. Um, top strategic risks I want to leave you with. We don't know exactly how much water is in the moon or how deep it is. We know there's water. We've proven it recently. Um, we think as a, uh, so we, uh, that uh, we don't know how plentiful it is and how deep it is. Um, that is a key issue we need to understand and as a strategic issue that if there's one thing we should do soon is send a resource prospector to the moon. Um, and so we recommend that. Um, summary of study conclusions, I want to, uh, this is Joe Rothenberg, uh, former head of human spaceflight, NASA human spaceflight. Um, who was, uh, could not be here, he had other commitments, um, but he left us with this quote that uh, um, he congratulated us, uh, congratulated us on an impressive study, and, but basically he's saying there's much more work to be done. This wasn't a um, conclusive study in um, saying this is the way you have to do it and, and uh, answered all the questions. It created a lot more questions that are useful, but what it did said, this could be much more economically affordable. I think it definitively answered that question, that using this approach you could you know, afford to go to the moon. Um, this is, we're not saying this is the way you do it. There may be better ways. Um, there, we're not saying that this is you, that the way, what you have to use it for. You could use this approach for other purposes. But uh, th from an economic research perspective, you could afford to go to, to the moon within NASA's existing budget. And finally, I just want to, this is in the, uh, your charts, uh, but for the people online, um, this is the URL um, for the, at researchgate.net. You can go pull down the 100-page report, uh, and um, that's it. Thank you.
And next on the agenda is a video from uh, Christopher Kraft, uh, generally referred to as Chris Kraft. As Chris Kraft. Uh, he was the uh, America's first space flight director, and you need to internalize what that means. The space flight director is the guy who's really in charge. He's God. He's really in charge uh, down at, at uh, Mission Control when there's a human space flight mission which is going on. So he makes the decisions, and uh, the buck stops with him. Uh, he sort of invented the concept of NASA Mission Control. He was the flight director for all of the Mercury missions, and he personally trained all the flight directors for the Apollo missions. Uh, he eventually became uh, a director, the, the director at uh, NASA's Johnson Space Flight Center. At one point, he was presented by the President of the United States the uh, Outstanding Leadership Medal, at the time President uh, John F. Kennedy. He was once on the cover of Time Magazine. He really became a legend in his own time. And in 2011, uh, the Johnson Space Center renamed its Mission Control Center the Christopher C. Kraft Jr. Mission Control Center in his honor. So let's have that video. Next Gen, which is a company owned by a friend of mine, was asked to do a study by NASA on uh, ways to go commercially and probably with the government back to the moon and uh, primarily an economic study to see whether that was feasible. Uh, the, the study has been made. Their report is now about to be in your hands and I think it's a very good one. It says that uh, it can be done. Uh, it will take good management and uh, good leadership on the part of both the aerospace industry and NASA. And hopefully, at the same time, we will be able to uh, establish what I call an international program office under which would be uh, all the other nations in the world that want to join with NASA in going back to the moon at this point in time, which is what the study was uh, carried out to do. The study has shown that uh, you can do it within the NASA budget. Now that might take longer than people might want, but uh, the study has shown that it can be done in about seven years from start. I think that's very optimistic, but that's not a bad thing at this point in time. Uh, now, the, the game plan is based, game plan, mission plan, if you will, is based on uh, utilizing the resources of the moon as a source of uh, both uh, rocket fuel to be obtained from the water on the moon. And so that is one of the weak parts of the study because we don't really know how much water is on the moon. If it's very little, then this study would not apply to what we want to do. We would we'd have to do it some other way. There are other ways. There have been studies made relative to the uh, fuel depots, both in Earth orbit or around the moon, that would supply the same thing. A cost estimate for that kind of program would have to be done. I still think that's the right approach. Now, embodied in this study are a number of tools which also have been advocated for some time now. One is a reusable spacecraft to go to and from the moon to carry both uh, equipment and eventually astronauts. And the other is a reusable lander which would go from lunar orbit to the surface. I think those are both great ideas, and I think you'll see that, how that would be done in this study. Uh, I'd like to point out that in the past, we, we have, have learned a lot of lessons from uh, how to prepare, how to manage, how to build things in space. And I think those lessons, for some reason in recent years, have been unlearned, if you will, as a word. I think it's very important that we go back and look at how we did that. Why did we do Gemini? Why did we come about 
with the game plan that we needed to land on the moon. First time we started thinking about going to the moon after, space, after President Kennedy challenged this country was to uh, two major approaches. One was to go from Earth orbit direct to land on the moon. The other was to just go direct to the moon, just as Jules Verne did. Now, what I want to point out is that was nonsense. Because when you started trying to do those kind of things, you saw how impractical that was. That's the major point I want to make about having a game plan, having a mission plan, because it drives what you have to do. It drives the technology to do it. It drives the learning process you have to go through to make sure you can do it, and then do it safely, and then accomplish the task. And I think that's what's got to be done in the future, whether we're going to Mars, whether we're going back to the moon, or whatever the goal of these combined people of the world is. What SpaceX is doing, what Boeing is doing, what they're doing with uh, uh, the Dream Chaser eventually, those are good programs. And they've shown that you can come up with ways of reducing cost and still doing the job in space. Uh, I think it's going to take a lot more effort than we have presently done by flying them more often, et cetera, and that's what will make it safer. So the, a, the commercial approach, along with uh, the, probably the help from the government and the management on top of that from both the commercial uh, uh, organizations and the government, we'll have to get together and see how we can do that a lot better than we've done it in the past to reduce the cost. You know, that, that's a challenge in the future, just like landing on the moon again will be. I think we've all recognized that eventually uh, exploration of space is going to be more money than the United States is willing to invest by themselves. I think, therefore, for, both from an economic point of view, from a diplomatic point of view, and from a technology point of view, we're better off bringing the people uh, from around the world into the space program that the United States is conducting. And we did that on the International Space Station, and I think it was extremely successful. It continues to be successful. And I think we will use it a great deal in days to come to perfect the programs that uh, uh, we've been talking about, and NASA is talking about, and what the other space cadets are talking about. And the problem we have there is management, and the problem we have there is uh, how to bring all this together and plan it and lay it out from a schedule point of view, from a technology point of view, and from the point of view of who's going to do what. And I thought, so therefore you have to have what I term a program, international program office that would uh, be made up of not only the United States, but, and they would take the lead, of course, but I think that they would bring in the people from the rest of the world who have the space uh, desires and who have the space experience and, and make them all part of the program, and they would be part um, not only the hardware that is built in their countries, but it also in the total management and the conduct of the programs in the future. Our next speaker will be Hoyt Davidson. He's our finance guy. He's a founding and managing partner of Near Earth LLC, a space investment bank and advisory firm. He's a member of the Commercial Space Committee of the NASA Advisory Council. He's had a 28-year career, 28 year career in investment banking. He's been an, an integral participant in providing over $15 billion in financing for various commercial space companies. And he's also vice president of my organization, the National Space Society. Hoyt? Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon. First, let me uh, reiterate what Joe Rothenberg said uh, about the Independent Review Committee. Um, uh, our group, looking at the economic um, viability of the plan, found absolutely no showstoppers. There, there are certainly 
uh, more things that need to be studied, um, you know, more answers and, and issues that need to be addressed. Uh, but bottom line, uh, we saw this as a very um, uh, economic and, and uh, doable business plan. Uh, one major of this effort was to make sure that evolvable also meant sustainable. Uh, this time we want to make sure humanity goes to stay, and that means the lunar architecture we choose has to be economically and politically sustainable for the long term and not just affordable and technologically feasible in the near term. To this goal, the ELA team came to four major conclusions. As Mr. Kraft just mentioned, we, we believe our return to the moon this time must be a broad international effort. Similar, but perhaps even broader in uh, participation than with the International Space Station. Space is hard and expensive. This will be a monumental achievement benefiting all mankind, and so the initial expense needs to be shared. That does not mean the U.S. cannot take a major or even a leading role. We hope it does. The important point is to establish an international governing body that all parties deem as fair and efficient. Uh, the study came up uh, with a lunar authority concept uh, in initial stages similar to something like CERN uh, as a close analogy, and perhaps in the later days transitioning to something more like a, a port or airport authority, uh, maintaining infrastructure and charging fees for use. Secondly, we found that this has to be a combined public-private effort involving numerous public-private partnerships with big established companies and small entrepreneurial corporations from around the world. This means the cost and risk of development is shared with industry, perhaps more government up front and more industry as markets develop, but shared. A project to build a lunar base funded solely with government funding even if broadly international, will not be sustainable. It would inevitably have a limited life, just like Apollo or the International Space Station. A sustainable architecture has to include a pathway to greater and greater private funding and therefore more control of specialized infrastructure and resources as new space markets develop, in particular the market for creating fuel from uh, the water on the moon. Part of our success will depend on our ability to build competitive new industries that innovate and grow as these new markets evolve. Missions end. Industries innovate, evolve, and survive. Third, to increase the probability of success, we need to make baby steps as opposed to focusing on grandiose mission achievements. As Mr. Kraft said, this is how uh, we got to the moon. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, even Apollo had flybys and robotic landers and, and orbiting before they try to put boots on the ground. Baby steps will allow us to, to lower the investment risk at each step, allow each step to build upon prior successes and avoid overly committing ourselves to any one technological direction. Innovation happens, sometimes quite rapidly. Political realities and funding availability changes and new space markets are uncertain in their pace of development. So baby steps are a key to survival and sustainability. Lastly, the evolvable lunar architecture has to take into account the fact that it, a permanent lunar settlement should not be an end unto itself, but be itself a building block and baby step for exploration and settlement of the rest of the solar system. The lunar architecture needs to include future human space goals into its planning, and this one does. For instance, the lunar settlement needs to enhance our ability to support further exploration and settlement of Mars and elsewhere. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Mosier. Uh, he served over 40 years uh, in various NASA positions, and just to name a, a few of the many positions he's had, uh, he's a former director of engineering at the Johnson Space Flight Center. He's a former NASA deputy associate administrator for human space flight, and he was the first director of the uh, first guy in charge of the space station project. Tom? Thank you and good afternoon. I want to just acknowledge what you've heard from Dr. Kraft. Um, he was more than a flight director. He was the father of mission control. He is the guy that's the 
oldest living pioneer of human spaceflight in the United States. He started in this program before there was a NASA. He's still very active, as you can see. His mind, his work goes on endlessly in this. So uh, it was an honor to be with him again and these other gentlemen in this program. Um, President Kennedy said, and I'm gonna review a little bit about why we have the foundation to do what's being proposed here in the architecture by ELA. Uh, President Kennedy said, we choose not to go to the moon because it's easy, but because it's difficult. Well, I think there's a little bit of update on that. I think, from my position, returning to the moon is easy, it's reasonable and affordable, and could be the pathway to Mars. In the Apollo program, we began that program, we didn't know what we didn't know. We had never put a human being in space when we started that. To do it, we had to do, a, there were a lot of challenges. We had to lift 6.4 million pounds from the Earth, we had to develop a crew transportation system to the moon. We had to have a landing vehicle on the moon. We didn't know how to navigate to the moon. We didn't know how to communicate to the moon. We didn't know how to organize to get there, but we did it because we had the will to do it. In, uh, in the uh, Mercury Project, we didn't know if humans could even function. A lot of the medical community said people will die. They won't be able to black out when they get there. Mercury was nothing more than to put humans in space to see if, in fact, we could live there. Then we knew to get to the moon, as Dr. Kraft said, we had to rendezvous and dock in space. There was a program called Gemini. This is incremental. The, the whole purpose of Gemini was to see if two spacecraft could rendezvous and dock in space. That was the way to get there. We proved that that could happen. Then we developed the launch vehicle. Then we developed the lunar module to carry people down to the surface Earth. The first spacecraft, true spacecraft ever built, it never lived in the atmosphere. Astronauts could put their finger through the sidewall in that spacecraft very easily. That's how lightweight it was. Then we got humans to the moon, and we did a lot of good, good work while we were there. Then to see if humans could stay long duration, not many people know about the Skylab program. People went up there and stayed for th months at a time, proved that they could function and be useful in space. There's another part of our foundation. We said we need a transportation system, so we developed the most technologically complex thing that's ever been in space, the space shuttle. The, Apollo had huge technical problems. There were a few technical problems on the shuttle, and including one of them was the thermal protection system where we had to put tiles all over the vehicle. In space station, when I was fortunate enough to be the first program director on that, this was not a technological issue. This was simple, okay? Apollo was extremely hard technically. It was very simple politically. Everybody wanted us to do it, including the president and all the public. Space station, simple technically, a very difficult thing to do politically. So we're kind of bearing there again, how do we use all this foundation to do this? Well, NASA's working on something called the Space Launch System. That's, that's a good program. How it plays into the program is an architectural element that needs to be decided, as along with the Orion spacecraft, which NASA is developing. But, in a big but, in parallel to that, in an all honor to them, the private sector is doing fantastic work. From Bigelow Aerospace looking at a hotel in space and livable habit bombs, volumes, SpaceX and Orbital Science sending goods to the space station, and on and on. Those are the things that, that Hoyt mentioned and that, that um, Chaz Charles Miller mentioned. That's the elements that we need to bring into the program. So we laid the foundation. We need the elements now of the private sector. We need the elements of international partners in a partnership way like was mentioned, perhaps to get back to the moon. So today, the United States has developed the capability with the government and private sector to form partnerships and to and to possibly form an international authority to incrementally return to the moon and perhaps to Mars. The evolvable launch architecture is, appears to be how to do it, not necessarily these way. The thing that is absolutely necessary, there has to be a will to do it. If there's not a will, it will not happen. Thank you.
Our last segment will be a video from Buzz Aldrin. Oh, he's on the phone. Yeah. Okay, well, not yet, Buzz. I have to say something nice about you. Uh, uh, well, actually, I was going to say he doesn't need much of an intro. Uh, but uh, look, you know, 40 years ago, today. Yeah, 46 years ago. Today. <laughs> yeah, this is government work, plus or minus. Um, he piloted the first space ship to land humans on the moon. Uh, there's not much more you can say than that, except I'll say one thing. He's also former chair of the board of directors of the National Space Society and currently serves on our board of governors. And with that, let's hear from Buzz. Buzz, now you can talk. Buzz, you're on the line. You're on. You're unmuted. No, no, you're on the phone. Hello? Go ahead and talk, Buzz. Okay. Uh, uh, I wish I could say that I am just uh, totally prepared for all of this. I think I uh, am in content, uh, but perhaps not in uh, the polish and the uh, backup numbers that, that you people have done so well. I wish that... Uh, that I could enlist uh, a good bit of the support that uh, I see evidenced uh, by this. <clears throat> However, I uh, think uh, we need to look at a bigger picture and to see where all of the desires and elements fit into uh, what we would like to do. And we've heard many times from different presidents that the ultimate objective is Mars. And I want you folks to know that that is my ultimate objective, and therefore it may be uh, somewhat glossing over some of the very good work that you've done, uh, because I just am not sure that we can afford to do those things that you've laid out and lay the groundwork that I feel is necessary <clears throat> to be able to uh, get humans to Mars and to do it in a very sustaining way. Uh, in contrast to a design reference mission, which may have been excellent for the lunar program taking humans from the surface of the Earth to the surface of the moon and back. We added a few things to it, like longer stay times, like rovers, uh, much more complex uh, experiments to be done. Uh, in, in some ways, we uh, added uh, EVAs on the way back, but we certainly had uh, the opportunity of more than two and a half hours. We were going six, seven hours and several days of EVAs. It was a uh, remarkable uh, progress, and we're building on so much of that uh, today. Uh, I would like to characterize uh, not a design reference mission to go to the moon or a design reference missions that I've seen for going to Mars as primarily concentrating around one synodic period and then dispatching the various elements that are needed to support uh, a crew landing during that time and supporting them and then bringing them back at the next uh, opportunity. I believe that our ultimate objective is a building up of a settlement colony, an accumulation of more and more people living permanently on the surface uh, of Mars, and that has been my uh, objective from the beginning. 
and I might characterize with uh, a different approach than taking a, a particular time period uh, and saying what do we need to accomplish a particular goal at Mars or at the Moon. And I would call that a sequential. It could start today or any year, but a year-by-year -year progression of tasks, of objectives, of missions, up to a steady state condition uh, delivering humans to the planet Mars. So it is sequential, but it is evolutionary, building upon the things that we do early on, some in Earth orbit, then in Earth to Moon transportation, uh, activities at the Moon, uh, learning how to have a base designed for many users, uh, landing that base and bringing it together assembling it in a way that supports how we would assemble a base on Mars. This assembly technique can be done, demonstrated first on the big island of Hawaii. And the U.S. role is to, and my plan is to assist in the overall modular design, designing the assembly from different landing locations with a rover that has a flatbed and a crane and brings these modules together, leveling them, and then interconnecting. So the transportation of bringing things together and the interconnects would be the U.S. role. The construction of the major modules would be international following U.S. design. Those modules at the moon, I would call exploration module second generation. The first generation is an inflatable, and the third generation is the exploration modules for uh, Mars. I have a few concise words written and gone over by myself, uh, by my son. And uh, I, of course, want to thank you, Charles, for giving all of us the opportunity of uh, digesting the, the great work that you put together and for participating in various ways in the support of your study. Uh, for many years now, I've been a very strong supporter of commercialization of space activities, and I believe this study, looking at the commercialization of lunar activities, will take space commercialization to the next logical opportunity. And the work that you've done with Next Gen Space on this study will accomplish uh, moving to that next logical opportunity. I think the study supports the objectives of missions to Mars. I don't think we want to get caught in the gravity well of the moon, except for commercial activities. NASA should focus its technology developing on developing systems necessary for Mars that can be tested on the moon. And we need to focus lunar development on bringing the international nations together and emphasizing the commercial activities, primarily the fuel and fuel depots that will be able to support the specific missions needed uh, to get us to Mars. We'll need millions of pounds of propellant 
to support the permanent presence on Mars, and it should be a sufficient market to create a sustainable commercial propellant industry on the moon. My approach would start as early as 2018 with a, an inflatable, stressing the international aspects. It would be at 42 degrees, the inclination of the Chinese orbit. In 2019, we can put an inflatable at L1, 2021 20, at L2. At some point, we would have developed the rigid modules, potentially a company like Alenia from Italy, who have done many pressure vessels for the space station. These. Uh, Modules would be first checked out with the inflatable in low Earth orbit, then at L1 and at L2. Uh, refueling uh, would be developed commercially, building upon commercial crew and cargo to the commercial station at 42 degrees, and then commercial crew and cargo to L1 and L2 with uh, lifeboat uh, remaining as at the space station for about six months, and uh, then being relieved and coming back down again. Uh, Buzz, uh, could you wrap it up quickly? We have uh, some deadlines here for the press that... Uh... Yeah, okay. That, that's the usual case. My uh, entire presentation is cycling pathways with intermediate exploration objectives leading to Occupy Mars, cycling spaceships, that can take three landers every other synodic period, six people per lander. We'd have six people at Phobos, and they would land and then be replaced by six more, so we'd be landing 18 people every synodic period on Mars. There are many other ways of using the cyclers for inbound and outbound, um, and I'd be happy to work with uh, the results of this study to be able to integrate uh, the things that you have done in the uh, broader, longer range picture that, that uh, I've come up with, uh, with Purdue University in over a thousand page study by spacecraft uh, design study work there <clears throat> that yeah, ended uh, in uh, April. Buzz, I, I think uh, that might be a good place to uh, end. Uh, I think okay. we're, a lot of people uh, would be interested in that, but we need to get along to the questions for the press conference. So thank you, Buzz. Okay. And uh, let's have some questions from the press. Press first. Yes. Hose from Defense Daily. Charles, could you explain the national security benefits of having these commercial companies get to the moon beyond just like uh, increased flight rates? Um, well, great. We, I'll, I'll talk about that. We talk about that a little bit more in the report. Uh, I think the proof is we've already seen the proof of the benefits of commercial partnerships between NASA and commercial industry for space station cargo delivery. Uh, with uh, we've recaptured leadership in commercial launch, but it's transforming national security launch as well at basically no cost to the DOD. You see SpaceX entering this and uh, creating competition um, and redundancy in space launch for DOD, and re and DOD really needs lower cost, reliable launch, and uh, they're coming in at major benefits to the national security as well as economic growth. In our scenario, you're going to have lots of flights of commercial launch vehicles that are being used both by DOD and NASA that are being used to take uh, 
uh, establish this commercially owned and operated lunar base with NASA as a customer. These flight rates, we believe, are going to drive significantly lower launch costs. You're going to see partially reusable launch vehicles uh, come into existence from both United Launch Alliance with their Vulcan launch vehicle, with the Falcon 9 partially reusable. Uh, we, we don't assume that you could close a fully reusable launch vehicle. Um, we uh, think it's uh, reasonable that you can do a partially reusable like SpaceX and Vulcan are developing and other, other, other uh, companies are developing. Uh, but uh, we think there's tremendous national security uh, benefits for uh, radically lower launch costs and high flight rates. And also the benefits of uh, robotics in, in orbit. Um, uh, DARPA is working on a program for uh, satellite servicing in orbit right now. Uh, they're also working on uh, the XS-1, much lower launch costs. So these are all things that uh, we would be driving the technologies for robotics, for additive manufacturing, for on-orbit rendezvous and dockings, for uh, uh, repair and maintenance, which would have significant national security benefits. And the DOD, from uh, STRATCOM to uh, senior leaders in the Department of Defense, are very concerned about uh, how uh, susceptible we are to uh, attack in space. And so this would have significant resilience benefits to DOD um, um, and spinoffs, and, and, and using the NASA word, um, for this partnership. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tom Risen with U.S. News and World Report. Thank you uh, for this presentation, and thank you to uh, Mr. Aldrin uh, 46 years ago, land on the moon. But uh, I, I think about, when I think about the future of space, I worry about uh, Russia and China. I know they're developing, China's expanding its space program. I think by 2017, they want to get a lunar sample back. They want to send something, is that right? I think it is. Uh, I, th I checked a few weeks ago. But how do we worry about, how, how do you factor in potential tensions with Russia and China when you think about uh, how we can have a sustained partnership with, it, it'll be hugely expensive, even if our companies take the lead, we would still have to worry, you know, we worry about defense contractors from other companies. I mean, other nations uh, don't give them complete access. How would we factor in future tensions to make sure that we can keep the business of, tra of space going if we have tensions on Earth? So you want to do that, Charles? Or yeah, I'll do it. Charles. Yeah. Um, well, we're not going to solve all the world's problems. So, um, the, I th we're, what we proposed and looked at in this study is that uh, we would go back to the moon with our uh, closest allies, with uh, free democratic nations that uh, who value um, basically democratic values and, and capitalism. And many, many of those nations are already partners with us in the International Space Station. So you start with free democratic nations who uh, are founded on the principles of capitalism and free people to build a partnership to go to the moon. And you'll see it in the report. We basically say, say that, that we think this would be the ultimate shining city on the hill. You would have a lunar base where people were living, per, uh, there was a permanent lunar base with people on the moon, and everybody across the world could look up and say, um, America and it's uh, Japan, China, not China, uh, Europe, Canada, our closest free democratic partners had a permanent lunar base, and we and you hold out an olive branch to uh, everybody else on the world. Said the message is: is when you're free democracy based on free enterprise, you can join the most exclusive club on or off the planet, and that would be this uh, uh, international partnership. Jeff. <coughs> Jeff Bow, Space News. What's the next step now that this report is done? Is there going to be a follow-on study? What sort of reaction have you gotten from NASA to turn this report into action rather than just yet another series of reports that have been offered over the years on uh, future human uh, exploration? So, uh, great uh, question, Jeff. Um, so to be fair to NASA, they've been a tremendous supporter of this. They supported this study. They provided lots of feedback during the study, and uh, which we incorporated into the study report. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the elected leaders of our nation that decide what's next. Um, they, they, uh, there's a decision on, uh, it's the White House and Congress that really need to decide whether this should be incorporated into this. So NASA supported this. Uh, they did an economic research. They've an helped, asked us to help answer the question, uh, how much would this cost and is it technically feasible? 
Um, if the White House and Congress would like NASA to look at uh, taking the next step, I think NASA would be quite responsive. But uh, so it's not, I wouldn't put the burden of this on NASA. Um, NASA is uh, uh, very responsive and supporting in this study. Um, so the real message of this is to the American people. Every time uh, the idea of going back to the moon is brought up, uh, the reaction to the press and the American people, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. We saw this four years ago when a candidate for a leading candidate for uh, president uh, proposed this, and the automatic reaction was that uh, you know they thought this was a $500 billion proposal. So one of the key messages here is we want to kill the idea that it has to cost hundreds of billions of dollars to go back to the moon. That idea sh should die a, a, a quick death. We have def think we have definitively answered that if you use a different method, public-private partnerships leveraging American free enterprise, that you could do it radically lower cost. And that's the core message. And, and the real audience is the American people and their elected leaders. And it's really up to them to decide what to go next. Um, and so we've completed our work for NASA. And there's no commitment beyond that. And but we'd be happy to. Uh, do the next phase if uh, if the U.S. government would like that, that to happen. Yeah, whatever NASA's the value of going back to the moon and these other things were yesterday, now looks like got ten times better. Yes. How much? How, how long do you think it would take to figure out how much water is on the moon? Well, there's. NASA is actually partnering with several commercial providers, Astrobotic, uh, Moon Express. I think the answers from them, uh, if they had a, uh, if you use a COTS-style partnership with one or both of them, competition is good. We did a competition with commercial crew and cargo space station. I'd, I'd uh, think uh, having funding both of them, you could r rather quickly, probably they would tell you their, their timelines would be probably in the, um, three to four years from if they started now. So you could have robots in the moon. They would, um, I think others would say quicker. I'm a little more conservative. Um, but uh, you could do, from the, the time the money turned on, I, they probably can do it in two years, but it'd take it a little more long to, to get the money flowing. Don't forget that um, when uh, President Kennedy said, put a man on the moon, return him safely to Earth, eight years later, eight years later we did it. So, you know, putting a robot up there and determining the amount of ice is, order of magnitude less complex. Sure. Okay, some more questions? Sarah? Hi, Sarah Fecht from Popular Science. Um, whenever we post articles about mining in space, we get a lot of reactions like, um, oh great, spreading human destruction everywhere. Is there any sort of environmental sustainability built into this plan? Well, actually, one of the great benefits that we talk about in the study, this will drive uh, s significant innovation in technology and, and close environmental technology. We're you, you, we going to have to close the environmental life support system much more completely than we do everywhere else. So the, there will be significant investments by NASA and commercial industry in, uh, in that technology. And uh, so that's part one of the answer. So that th there will be great benefits to um, environmental uh, cleanup technology. Second, um, the m moon is lifeless. We've proven that. Um, we will be taking life to where there is no life. And so uh, there, is, there are no um, people there. There's, uh, there's no life to uh, damage or destroy. So we'll be, uh, in a, and a big picture message, expanding life into the universe by taking humanity and life itself permanently into the solar system. In some sense, we'll be greening the moon. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Uh, Clark Lindsay, New Space Global. Uh, you mentioned that this would help drive development of reusable uh, space transportation. What about the other way around? I was wondering, say SpaceX, Blue Origin, and others are successful lowering costs dramatically by three or four. Does that mean the cost of this program would also drastically be reduced? Or does it uh, only affect it 10%? Go ahead. So we, we assumed uh, 
slow, mar small progress towards reusability. Um, but if SpaceX develops a fully reusable launch vehicle, or Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos at, um, with his fortune develops a fully reusable, or maybe Paul Allen with Strato Launch, it changes everything. It gets radically lower and becomes much easier. So, but we didn't assume that. Um, but uh, we would hope that uh, larger markets of uh, transporting propellant and other things to orbit will help them even incentivize them even more to invest their uh, uh, um, deep pockets and their great innovation in this area. Okay, any additional questions? Does somebody have questions who's not from the press? Okay. Then I thank you for your time and let's have a big hand for all our speakers and, and uh, cool videos and whatnot. And that's a wrap. Thanks everybody.